हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ ग्रोथ फिट इंटरव्यू सीरीज दिस इज अगेन गोइंग टू बी अ फन एंड वेरी नॉलेजेबल सेशन फॉर अस एज वी हैव एमिलिया विद अस टुडे शी इज वर्किंग विद यूज अ पायलट एंड लेट्स लेट्स वेलकम हर एंड नॉट वेस्ट एनी टाइम टू uh just grab around all the things and really really i appreciate your time emilia thank you so much for joining us today thank and welcome welcome emilia thank you so much for having me ashwini thank you i am ashwini and i am growth engineer at custom fit ai it uh, custom fit ai will help you understand your visitor personalize the your website not the web page but your complete website uh, from Zero to hundred. So uh, please, please uh, join us today in this session and gain a knowledge about marketing from left to right, top to end, top to bottom. About uh, we will we will understand all the things about marketing today. So basics from Emilia. Uh, let's let's just start. Uh, we would love to hear about you and your journey, uh, Emilia. Like uh, from financial financial journalism editorial intern to head of marketing. So how you started? What all challenges you faced, and how did you overcome them? Right. So um, that was a very very long journey. Actually, you picked. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> something that happened pretty early on um, in my career. Um, basically, I've always been really into writing, while at the same time being quite analytical. So you know, I, I knew I wanted to be a journalist early on, since I was like 12, 13. And, oh. and then, as a teenager, I spent you know a lot of my free time writing, and you know, was getting my first publications and magazines, and basically, then I went on to work for several journals related to well, either finance or real estate, and politics as well at that time. But ultimately, I got a little bit disillusioned with journalism. um because i felt like as a beginner journalist i actually had very little to say um and yeah yeah um in terms of like you know controlling the editorial process and actually seeing the impact of what i was doing um so you know ultimately i changed the course a little bit did a research degree um and then you know continued my career in well I did some research for for a while then I worked a bit at universities um but ultimately my entrepreneurial streak took over and I started working with um software as a service businesses um and at first through my agency you know providing content to them then I got more and more hooked ultimately I was also um I co-founded um a software as a service startup in china and after after getting out of the moving back to europe um i first joined another software as a service company as a you were also there in poland right was yeah. you yeah i'm i'm originally from poland so okay yeah yeah i did two years of my undergrad degree there then i moved to germany then i moved to the uk where i'm still now um <laughs> I I lived in uh, in several countries actually yeah um but ultimately one thing led me to another and you know I discovered um you know marketing for software businesses is something that kind of combines my passion for writing with you know my analytical mind so that was something that I ultimately came to enjoy most and specialized in right so i i am curious to understand about your journey in china like how mm. uh, the people you work with how, how is it it is different uh, from every place like any any experiences specific experiences in every country that you work with oh yeah um china is very very different from europe i would say from all the countries that i've been in and worked in for a while um which was a few germany ireland uk sweden um you know but um oh. i'd say china was was the most um any kind of work culture 
work yeah, culture, culture, and culture especially. So, you know, Chinese people are very indirect, right? So there's this whole concept of the loss of face, right? And, um, you know, people want to tell you exactly what they think directly. They can um, be sort of very much beating around the bush and you don't know where, where you're standing. And that can lead to a lot of um, miscommunications. Um, yeah, so people can tell you yes when they think no, in fact. And then they just <laughs> kind of disappear and don't ever mention it again. Um, so this has happened to us when we were trying to basically um, sell our software um, to Chinese business owners. And uh, what kind of work culture is there in London now? UK or oh well mostly remote I would say London is a very multinational <laughs> city so say you know everybody tries to be efficient and direct mm. but at the same time polite um, it's very difficult to speak of a specific you know work culture in London because almost everyone in London is not from London. <laughs> okay. Right. So it's a mix, I would say. Okay. So uh, you are you were having that chance to work with a, each and every work culture. Like your colleagues must be from uh, so many places. Oh yeah, absolutely. Out. So user pilot is a remote really first company. Um, so you know we only have an R and D office in Palestine. The company itself is based in in the US. But when it comes to the marketing, sales departments, um, we have people everywhere, really. So, you know, Germany, Romania, um, Canada, England, several different countries. Um, yeah, so I don't know. We're probably um, from more countries than the United Nations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, what kind of problem you solve in user pilot? Like, uh, and what marketing philosophy you follow to keep the spread up? All right, so, so that, that's a very broad question. Let me tackle one at a time. <laughs> so what problem okay. we solve? We solve several problems um, for product teams in software as a service industry. So, you know, the problems with user activation, the problems with user onboarding, the problems with feature adoption, feature engagement, user engagement, then user disengagement and ultimately churn, <laughs> right? And the flip side, which is user retention. Also upsells, account expansion, user sentiments, so, you know, what your users think about you. So UserPilot is a platform, basically, that allows product managers and product marketers to build in-app experiences without coding. So we kind of sit on top of your native app, right, as a kind of engagement layer, right? So all these little tool tips, walkthroughs, guides, checklists, you can build without any knowledge of coding in UserPilot on top of your web app. Um, so that, in fact, empowers the product tools, um, product teams to um, create enough experiences independently from the developers. Right. So I think uh, it's a need of today, right? Uh, what yeah. sort of problem yeah, you're you solving? You're, yeah, you're I mean, SaaS industry is growing rapidly. There are more and more software as a service products, right? And to stay competitive, you need to be agile, right? So you can't, you know, build everything from scratch and keep reinventing the wheel when you can use a ready-made widget, right? So I think nobody would argue today that well, marketers should be using email marketing tools rather than hard coding emails in HTML, right? And sending them via SendGrid. Um, the same, I believe, in a couple of years will apply to product growth and in-app experiences, right? That it won't be the domain of engineering anymore. Um, it will fly basically with the product department. Right. And uh, what strategy you follow to understand your customer and website visitor? Right. So, well, the first 
very basic thing is just talk to your customers regularly, right? Talk to your users, talk to your customers, try to understand, you know, what problems they are coming to solve with your tool. Um, I try to listen to one call or ideally jump on one call per week at least. Um, other than that, we're using session recording tools to see how the users are interacting with our website and our product. Um, we are also using our own tool, which involves user analytics, right, to see which features the users are adopting, um, where they are in the user journey, where they are getting stuck in the user journey and need help, etc., etc. So yeah, I would say there is um, a more direct and um, qualitative side to it, which is basically conversations and more indirect and quantitative, which is using all these um, product intelligence tools. And uh, what techniques uh, like do you see or do you draw to attention, to seek the attention for your prospects and customers? Mm, like uh, what techniques you do you use uh, what techniques do you use to draw the attention of your users and customers like or prospects? Um, so you mean for acquisition, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so basically our main strategy relies on organic content. So, you know, in fact, I could say we are not a software company. We are a media company, in, um, at least in terms of the marketing department. So we're trying to produce high quality content that um, corresponds to the needs of our users. So, you know, um, provide solutions to the problems they are looking to solve on Google mostly. So it's an organic SEO strategy um, mostly. Apart from that, we also do a bit of um, paid ads and we do a bit of um, event marketing. So we have an annual conference for product managers and product marketers called Product Drive happening this October. We do some webinars from time to time, but I would say like yeah, our most main focus is on content right now. Okay, so uh, your formula is basically content, right? Yeah, I would say 80% content, um, so organic SEO content on the blog, and 20% other initiative content distribution, so redistributing the content via different channels, uh, repurposing the content, also a bit of Google Ads, and a bit of event marketing. Right. And um, like, how do you ensure that your website is personalized with content based on your audience? Like with you're content. showing right, right content to your right visitor, that particular visitor. I would don't really personalize the website that much. We have a roles section on the home page. So if someone is looking for specific solutions for, say, product marketers versus product managers, they can go to the right page of the website and see how user pilot helps this specific role. But, you know, since we are a pretty robust platform that can do a lot of things, we actually don't want to limit ourselves to displaying only one functionality of the platform to a specific user. Um, so, yeah, apart from that, we have in the past used a chatbot, right? So do a bit of conversational marketing. We don't really do that so much anymore. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, and what mat metrics do you use to measure your post-click performances, like sign up or login or a uh, quick demo or any any click? Uh, so how do you really uh, uh, measure that? What metrics do you use? Um, post-click performance. Um, so you will need to define a specific click event, right? Because like obviously what happens after someone clicks on a link or on a demo or um, books a demo or signs up for a free trial is very different, right? So 
you know, I can't answer the question if it's so broad, I'm afraid, so. Okay. So we'll uh, move to next question. So what is the major source of lead generation for you? So as I mentioned, that's organic SEO. Organic, right. And uh, you're working in the SaaS industry for so long. So what is your take about SaaS marketing or growth? Again, a very broad question that you know I can't answer unless you specify it. Because like, what what do you mean by what is my take on fast marketing or growth? That's like, <laughs> uh, like uh, it was. Uh, if you say uh, two thousand and five, mm. uh, it was different. So you're working uh, like in SaaS industry uh, when you started. Uh, what were what was the scenario that time? And right, we are right now in that situ situation. 2020 has tra transformed us uh, in a very different way. So now we are in a different phase. So how it was mm. uh, for you at that time when you started and how it is right now and how it is difficult or easy for everyone to sell your product or, or uh, what kind of challenges they faced in uh, the today's scenario so okay all right so i would say the major shift is towards product-led growth in the SaaS industry right so unlike 15 years ago which i can't talk about from my personal experience because you know i was in high school 15 years ago so i actually don't have such a long career in uh, in SaaS. um but you know back then um, software used to be a lot less user friendly and um, there was a lot fewer cloud based solutions. It was all very nascent, right? So um, buying decisions used to be made by executives, by the ICO. So um, the information chief officer would select, you know, the right tool for a specific department, right? Then they would sign an enterprise grade contract, right, with a big on-prem solution, a company would then come in and install the store on a desktop computer for the employees, right, and then they were stuck with it for years, sometimes locked into a very expensive enterprise contract, right. Today, the situation is completely different. Um, the SaaS industry is growing rapidly, so there's so many different solutions on the market, right? Usually you pay only monthly. Um, you don't have to you know, subscribe to even an annual contract. You can try things out through a free trial, right? And see what is the best fit, not for your whole company, but for specific users that are ultimately going to be the end users. So it's actually the end user that is making the buying decisions right, for right. their company, right, they say, well, we mm -hmm. need a tool to do this and that, right, we've done our research, we tried, you know, five different options, you know, we did the free trials, now we need you to pay for this specific tool, and we decided to use this specific tool because it's the easiest for us to use, it has, you know, all the features that we need, right, so there is a lot more competition for your end user's attention. Also, the importance of user experience is much, much bigger, right? And usually you only have like a couple of days to convert the free trial user into a customer, right? right? So the first impressions really, really matter. And this is also user pilot's mission, right? So as a product right. growth platform, we want to make sure that you are able to onboard these new trial users as quickly as possible, reduce your time to value through these enough experiences, right? Okay. And guide them through to reach the activation points, which is an important post-click metric, by the way. Okay. Um, and that they can get their value in as short a time as possible, right? Because you really don't have any time to waste. There are so many other competitors that are already doing these things better than you. Right. So how can you sell um, a trial user on your software in as short time as possible? Right. This is the kind of question that we are helping our our users to answer. And this is, I would say, the biggest shift right, from software industry 15 years ago to what it is now. Um, I think. 
yeah i think that is a really deep insight from you and uh, once you. we had uh, one interview with uh, robert pavlik he uh, mm-hmm. he was working with uh, uh, key bank as marketing director so he said uh, this power has shifted now like uh, that power of this buying decision was like uh, customers were behind the products and yeah. now products is behind the customer so this change uh, has uh, this change is really important to consider when you are going to sell something in today's world i suppose uh, so coming to the next question uh, this is something uh, to uh, re- relevant to your life so please tell us something about your experience at uh, varsity newspaper as news correspondent <laughs> Well, that was a very long time ago. Um, not entirely sure why you picked this one, but uh, basically it was a student's newspaper at Cambridge University. So, you know, as I mentioned, I've been interested in journalism, um, you know, in my teenage years and early 20s. So um, basically I was reporting on college news, you know, um, yeah. I had, um, I think I basically, had a column. Yeah. yeah, basically I picked up this question because uh, mm. many of the students from India or uh, across the globe are moving, uh, shifting from their place, uh, em- uh, immigrating from their place to uh, explore places and uh, with, with some motivation to uh learn something from this particular university so our our mm. series is basically for the fellow marketers also like uh, they can understand what is there in marketing demand generation what is there in content marketing what is there in um uh, what do i say in in growth so uh they will understand before uh, jumping into the or diving into the world this marketing world so uh, this is why i picked up this question so uh, basically uh, to understand uh, which university how how is the experience of uh, the veterans uh, to the fol- uh, fellow marketers mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah as i said like i wouldn't call myself a veteran yet i'm not that old but um essentially this particular experience in general my experience at cambridge university I would say it didn't have that much direct impact on what I'm doing now, right? So, um, you know, like these old school universities are, well, very old school, right? So (laughs) they usually teach you skills that are primarily, primarily used in research, right? Or pure arts or pure sciences. Um, so I studied linguistics, I did research into um, second language acquisition um, and you know, I would say what was relevant in this experience for you know, my work at, as a head of marketing was the analytical thinking and critical thinking skills. So definitely going to a good university is going to challenge you in a lot of ways, right? Um, right. You're not going to be left let off the hook in terms of, you know, arguing efficiently, arguing um, your stance, presenting your ideas in a way that is powerful and that kind of communicates the message. So I would say this is a transferable skill that really helps in content marketing, right? It's a very common complaint that writers these days don't understand, you know, how to communicate effectively. They write in a very convoluted style um, while they actually have very little to say oftentimes, right? Um, So, yeah, I would say the experience with with good universities, it's, it's the opposite. You're required to communicate complex ideas in a simple language rather than the other way around and oh, that helps that, that's the biggest task that's mm-hmm. the biggest task. yeah <laughs> uh, so we always say data is important so what is your secret formula in designing a paid campaign or what data points do you use when you design a paid campaign right um so 
First of all, I would say my secret to paid campaigns is hiring a good growth manager because I'm not an expert in paid and in the paid <laughs> channels. Um, um, definitely, you know, specialised in organic. Um, however, obviously, you know, I'm aware of what we are doing. Um, so, you know, the basic metric is your keyword research. So, search volume and and the CPC. So, basically, you know, cost per click. You're looking at um, the overlap um, between your campaigns and your competitors' campaigns, right? So the um, use share um, yeah you're looking at also the efficiency of your campaigns in terms of you know the CVR so conversion rate the click-through rate of your ads and um, in order to arrive at these metrics you need to experiment a lot so you need to see how different ad copy different URLs different um, the features as well um, work for different audience on different markets, right? So say, are you good to go with using your homepage, right, for a campaign? Or do you need to build specific landing pages right, that are going to restrict certain elements um, for a higher conversion rate, for a higher click-through rate? Obviously, there is the ad copy um, that matters. But you know, you, you need to have a sizable budget in order to make create experiments that would be, you know, statistically significant. So I would say if you have less than, you know, at least five figures to spend on um, paid campaigns per month, you shouldn't go into it because you just won't have the volume in order to experiment with different markets, different copy, etc. Uh, that that's again a valuable information i would say and uh, what what do you think uh, is the most effective way of increasing a brand's online presence so, that co content yeah um obviously <laughs> i'm gonna say i'm gonna repeat myself here several times yeah. but why is content the most effective way to spread brand awareness when you think about it and we've tried different methods. We tried, for instance, conference sponsorship, right? We tried webinars. But the problem with these um, brand awareness building tactics is that they are very short lived, right? So you spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money. When it comes to conference sponsorship, it goes into tens of thousands of dollars, right? Per a booth at a conference. And, um, you know, you go there, you spend Two days getting in front of say 300 or maybe 3,000 people at best. If you go to a bigger conference like Web Summit with like 70,000 participants, it's just you know too overwhelming, and you still want to get in front of more people than you know a couple thousand. Um, and then it's over. It's done. Usually you don't get the leads that you generated at this conference to nurture later on even if you did the conversion rate from this is still going to be very low because people go to general conferences they don't go there to buy software you don't know if they have the specific problem that your tool is solving the only way where you can meet the needs of your customers when we are talking about inbound strategies of course right because we are currently only doing inbound um, is SEO right so if somebody is typing in a um, specific keyword into you know their search engine usually google let's face it um they are looking for a solution to their problem right or they are looking to educate themselves about a specific um by methodology right or tool or they are looking for some inspiration they want to know what other people are doing so they're looking for case studies, how to use a specific tool in a specific context, or how to build something, how to build a template, how to build a specific type of website. Or, you know, the question you asked me, right? Like, um, say, best paid ads strategies for SaaS in 2021. That's a long tails keyword that someone that is looking for solutions to improve their paid strategy, 
right, uh, for their SaaS business would be typing into Google. So trying to cater to all these searches, trying to cater to the needs of the different user personas that you may have, and think like what language they are using, right? What problems they are looking to solve with your product and meeting them halfway, meeting them out there where they need you is in my mind the best way to increase brand awareness. So in a nutshell, in short, keyword SEO visibility. Right, so basically we would uh, definitely go for this strategy and even we should implement the strategy for us uh, as custom fit, mm. I would say. And uh, la coming to last two questions, Emilia, like I don't want to stop, but yes, with the time constraint, we have to, uh, mm. I have to, but uh, I would like to understand uh, what, what that one advice you would like to give to a fellow marketer or entry level marketer to for their successful career in this life. Right, so I would say, you know, pick one area of marketing. Marketing is so diverse and you can specialize in so many different things. Pick something that is aligned with your skills, right? That is aligned with your talents. So if you're very creative, if you're very good at writing, right, you can decide to specialize in content marketing, right? If you're very analytical, if you are, you know, maybe you don't write that well, but, um, you know, you are sort of interested in data and you're good with data, then you can focus on, you know, like data analytics for marketing or maybe in paid ads, right? Um, if you go at uh, design, you know, you're good at creating visual assets, then you can like, decide to specialize in the area related to graphic design in marketing, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there are a lot of different domains. I give you like three very broad um, you know, domains here, but you, know, you name it. You just need to pick something that is compatible with your natural skills. Um, and go deeper. And then really, yeah, really, really specialize in that. But at the same time, you should have an overall general knowledge about like the other areas of marketing. And this is the so-called T-shaped marketer, right? So like a T, you have a broad knowledge over a lot of different um, areas, and then you have a very deep knowledge about one. I, I think that's a tagline for today. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And uh, well, lastly, uh, I'm curious to understand about your mentor in this marketing and growth. Right, so I would say the person that is, you know, mentoring me, mentoring our team directly is um, Don Leo Weber. Um, Weber. <laughs> He's um, the former VP of marketing at um, Project Manager. There was um, basically a project management tool, a SaaS tool um, for project managers, anyone who need project management tools, and he you know, quadrupled his company in a matter of two years using mostly SEO organic content and paid Google ads. Um, so he's extremely knowledgeable in the area of SEO, organic content strategy. Um, so he helped us build our strategy. Um, I also follow John Bonini, who's the CMO head of marketing at Databox and um, I follow him on LinkedIn and I uh, subscribe to his yeah, Patreon. Yeah, even I have followed, followed All right, him. great, I've seen great. Him, but, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's sharing Databox really team. good instant, um, insights um, on content marketing, which helps me a lot. Um, yes, I would say these two. I, I hope he, uh, I get his interview also. <laughs> I get <laughs> that awesome. opportunity. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, if you do keep me posted, I would love to listen to it. Definitely. And with this information, I'll wrap up the session today. Thank you so much, Amelia, for joining us in this Thank uh, you, Grow, Growth at Fit interview series. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, watching this and following us on every social media as, as possible. Thank you. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you so much.
Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.